Viewer discretion is advised. According to Norse mythology and my drunk Swedish father, there exists a colossal and monstrous serpent. This serpent has its coils spread around the world and the world tree. It will also battle the mighty Thor to the death. He said that the world serpent is no myth. It actually exists, and he has proof. Understandably, when I heard this, I chalked it up to my dad having a little too much to drink. But then he pulled out the pictures. What I saw was nothing short of mystifying, and it made me feel incredibly small in the universe. I saw the body of a serpent that was easily dozens of feet wide and tall, spreading endlessly through a vast frozen cavern. When I asked my dad how he was even able to get such photos, or if they were real, he went silent for a minute. He then explained that it was an old friend of his, now passed away, who took them. Shortly after taking these photos and presenting them to my dad a few decades ago, his friend fell ill. It was just a fever at first, but then deafness followed, then blindness, and eventually paralysis, all in the span of 48 hours. His flesh became necrotic and dripped off his body in chunks an hour or two before his death. My father called it the Curse of Jormungandr. Hello everybody, I'm The Rubber. Today, we bring you SCP Foundation Keter Class Object SCP-722. SCP-722, also known as Jormungandr, is an enormous serpentine entity found frozen in a glacial cavern in Greenland. Hypothesized by Foundation researchers to have been sleeping since even before the 11th century, this monstrous serpent is estimated to be 8 miles long with a muscular body. However, who built the tunnels within this cavern wherein 722 sleeps? The Foundation does not know. What is known is that some portions of 722's head and tail are covered in an ancient Nordic script. Although it is partially buried and encased in glacial ice, not to mention being in deep slumber, the Foundation remains cautious. Should 722 awaken, the Foundation fears it will threaten all of humanity due to its sheer size. It is reported that people who discovered 722 quickly fell ill and died, all from being in close proximity of 722 and not necessarily touching it. If its very existence is a poison, the Foundation shudders at what else it is capable of. The following recording provides a short glimpse into what havoc may come should 722 awaken. My name is Cole, and I'm an archivist for the Foundation. Today, I am given the opportunity to report on the automatic defensive capabilities of the serpentine entity 722. First and foremost, the toxin is yet to be identified, unsurprisingly. When a person comes in contact with the poison dripping from its body or the gas it emits, they will fall ill almost instantaneously. Once the poison has entered a person's system, they are as good as dead. One can forget about an antidote, as all attempts at creating one have failed. Further testing is required as the panacea pills have yet to be administered to infected individuals. However, doing so in addition to normal testing of the poison prove extremely difficult. The poison is observed to disintegrate and becomes completely harmless after being removed from the cave. This means all testing must be conducted near the body of 722, putting everyone involved at risk of death. Some say that the poison is not for defensive purposes at all. Instead, it is to be used in combat against the God of Thunder. At least, that's how the myth goes. Also, it should be noted that the poisonous gas 722 emits is not as deadly as the liquid its body secretes. Still dangerous regardless. Explorations into the glacial cavern are forbidden, except in the case of maintenance. This is due to an incident where 722 has shown an increase in brain activity. Frightened by this, the Brigadier General of Site 103 has declared that anyone seen entering or leaving 722's cavern will be shot on sight, no questions asked regardless of their standing in the Foundation. I do not think he was kidding, as I have heard several gunshots in the middle of the night once. On my last day, I had the pleasure of witnessing 05-1 in action as he discussed with the Site Director and several researchers about what to do with 722 should it awaken. Obviously, the first measure to be taken would be to evacuate Site 103 and all nearby towns and cities. Researchers also believe that due to 722's sheer size and its tough hide, any attempts to damage it using conventional weaponry would be useless. 
Our only chance would be to have several thaumaturgical cannons on Site 103 to try and kill it, and pray to God it works. Should this fail, Site Director L has proposed getting SCP-190-DE to help in containing or even slaying 722. If the Nordic stories are true, then he might be our only chance. 190? Ugh, Thorsten Nordman? Love the guy, but he should not be counted on. Hasn't Thorsten declared himself the protector of Midgard? Surely, if we called on him to help with 722, he would answer. <laughs> you would think so, wouldn't you? Ask yourself this. Where was Thorsten when the Kaju wrecked havoc on the world? Where was Thorsten when SCP-6004 slaughtered millions? Thorsten is incredibly powerful. This is true, without a doubt. While he possesses power beyond imagination, he is incredibly out of practice when it comes to fighting. Moreover, we have him on phone records where we think he told his father, Odin, that he refused to fight the snake. As difficult as this may be to hear, Thorsten is a non-factor. Always has been, and most likely always will be. Site Director L fell silent as he realized he was unable to refute what his superior had said. But do not fret. We already have something in the works. Ever since the incident with 6004 and the Kaiju, we have been working on an armor dubbed Myonir Type 3. It is an advanced combat exoskeleton that fully seals around the wearer. It filters out all toxins and comes equipped with miniature thaumaturgical weapons. It also makes the user stronger and faster to the point that they become a god relative to humanity. Gentlemen, who would like to sign up and become a real protector of Midgard? No experience needed. Myonir has automatic defensive capabilities. Fair warning though, you'll be fighting entities on the level of gods. It was then that I raised my hand. I was accepted without question by the council. And while I have yet to begin testing with the Myonir armor, I could feel that the Foundation has gotten one step closer to securing, containing, and protecting our fragile little world with what it promised. Or so it would seem. Just then, my father burst through the door. No, the Myonir plan or whatever you have in mind must not proceed. The Jormungandr must not be disturbed. Father, what on earth are you doing here? Who is this man? And how did he get in here? Security! You must not touch the World Serpent, otherwise a great apocalypse will befall us. <laughs> what, what are you doing? Let me go! As he struggled to fight off the guard's hold, 051 walked forward and calmly dismissed them. What are you saying? What apocalypse? My father sat down to catch his breath. He handed me a couple slides and told me to put it under the projector. The first image showed a comparison between the frozen 722 and what looked like an ancient symbol, which looked eerily like 722. Jormungandr, the world serpent, must remain as it is. You see, the way it's grasping its tail? That's the Araboros, the seal that keeps the worlds balanced together. It must not be broken. I turned to the next image, which sent the room into murmurs. It was a series of paintings as well as carved ancient runes and scripts which corresponded to the ones on 722. The paintings depicted 722 now having released its tail from its grasp, engaging in battle against a few human figures. That's Ragnarok, or part of it. What you're seeing here is a fierce battle between two mortal enemies, Vormungandr and Thor, or Thorsten Nordman, as you call him. Wait a minute. You mean it happened before? Eons ago, Jormungandr released its tail and caused violent unrest. The serpent thrashed onto land and flooded it. It advanced and sprayed poison, filling the air and water. It confronted the gods, and Thor stepped forward to fight it. They fought a bloody battle that lasted days and nights. Ultimately, Thor was able to fend off Jormungandr and brought back Ouroboros, the balance of the world. But we still detect signs of life from this Jormungandr, and if Thor could defeat it back then, surely he can do it again, and more easily this time with our gear. He won only because of the help from other gods. Why do you think Thor didn't help fend off 6004? The poison of Jormungandr wounded Thor deeply. It almost killed him if it wasn't for Ear's healing powers. Even then, the poison had severely crippled him. Another battle with an entity of such caliber would mean certain death. The room fell silent. 05-1 let out a sigh 
and walked out without saying anything. Site Director L only patted me on my shoulder and followed 05-1. Soon, everyone left the room. Only me and my father remained. I looked at the image and shuddered. If the gods had this much trouble to contain that thing, what chance do we even have? I guess the glacier is the only thing standing between the continuation and end of civilization. Viewer discretion is advised. I was an infant when the great serpent god attacked our land. Father said that it used its magic breath to burn away our cities in order to purge us of our sin and indulgences. That it roared and summoned the monstrous winds and waves to clean our lands and wash away the innocent blood spilled from war. How its body glittered the purest colors in order to show off its brilliance and majesty to us all so that we may never forget it. Father says that its eyes could see all and counted the transgressions committed by all, swallowing up the impure and unrighteous. Its countless number of teeth chewed up the damned. The thing is, the righteous were not safe either, like they believed, for they too met the same fate. Father says that even the good-hearted were slain for their impassivity. The rainbow god would bring death to all it came across. When I asked what happened after it left us, my father smiled. It brought back the beauty of our land. He gestured, showing lovely green pastures and bountiful waters. But be warned, if we do not stay humbled and close to nature, the rainbow god will strike us down. Do you understand, son? Yes, father, I whispered, looking at the painting of the serpentine god stretched across the cave wall. Hello, everybody, I'm the Rubber. Today, we bring you a SCP Foundation Tiamat class object, SCP-6004. SCP-6004, also known as the Rainbow Serpent, is an unbelievably massive entity that resembles a monstrous snake that can morph its body to either be just over a tenth of a mile to as big as 1100 miles in mass and size. The head of the entity shifts between different species of ophidians, leaving its true face unknown. Puzzlingly enough, 6004's body is both at the same time tangible and intangible at random intervals and whenever it chooses to. Speaking of its body, it is mostly charcoal black but with rings of different colors around its body. Two curved horns with the engravings of different animal species and a number of teeth impossible for any creature to possess. 6004 is able to propel itself through the air and water by moving in a serpentine fashion faster than the speed of sound. Due to its combined speed and size, its movements will cause tsunamis to form and sonic bursts to surge through the air. Mentally, 6004 is able to alter the weather across the planet simultaneously, whenever it wills it. Finally, 6004 is capable of swallowing and regurgitating anything that it wishes, but will often swallow animals only to throw them back up into where they belong. After the Foundation failed in its efforts to stop 6004, they decided to join forces with the Global Occult Coalition GOC, the Church of the Broken God, and Marshall, Carter, and Dark Limited in the construction of a weapon, a long-range charged particle emitter, or Project Mongoose. A meeting was called by 05-1 following the failure of the prototype of Project Mongoose. A representative from each organization and Site-14's director, Alan Tibbles, were present. Oh, how the Great Foundation has fallen. Do you see now how containment of these creatures is pointless? My dear O5, surely you understand now that if you were as dedicated to the eradication of anomalous entities as we are, we would have the technology to kill this behemoth ten times over. That pathetic particle emitter barely hurt it. Do not speak to me about what we should have done. Billions are dead. Australia blown to ashes. Russia incinerated. The USA nearly underwater. Need I go on? The petty squabble we have cannot continue if we are to produce something to stop 6004. The prototype simply wasn't as ready as we thought. That is why we shall redouble our efforts and send a mongoose up into space for an orbital bombardment. But this time, it shall be bigger, more powerful. What does the Church of the Broken God think about this? I'm afraid I must concur with the GOC. If the Foundation was not so lenient with these despicable things, we would not be in this mess, especially after your Foundation has worked so tirelessly to thwart our efforts as well. The Mongoose prototype was, and is, a failure, 
due to you stifling the growth of true saviors. What say you, representative from Marshall, Carter, and Dark? I get paid regardless. I vote for whatever plan is decided on. Just keep us alive and I'll play along. Get you all you need. Listen to you all. Do you not remember how that damned beast shrugged off 12 nuclear warheads and sent the radioactive wave to destroy all of Beijing? Yet all you care about is attacking the Foundation? The next mongoose will be enough. We simply need more time. It is your fault billions died, not ours. Their blood is on your hands and yours alone. And now you want us to risk our lives in the construction of something that will most likely not work at all? Fat chance. Site director Alan Tibbles slowly stood up and looked at each representative one at a time, silencing them with a stern look. Things have not gone how we wanted them to. We all know that. The world knows of 6004's existence and possibly numerous other SCPs at this point. We could barely scratch this beast and you have good reason to believe we shall all die here. But you couldn't be more wrong. What are you suggesting? What I have to say is this. Our foundation has defeated threat after threat and extinguished every end of the world scenario, every bloody god, and every reality warping monstrosity you can think of, even when hope was lost. This is no different. We have saved humanity from destruction while you and the Church of Broken Gods sat around. The representatives only looked down when called out. Tibbles continued, Every day we fail, yet we learn more about this creature. And do you know what our biggest advantage is right now? The world knows of all of our existences. We don't have to hold back anymore. Following this rousing speech, the representatives then agreed to work on the orbital mongoose and to dedicate all the resources they had in order to destroy or contain 6004. After the successful completion of an orbital mongoose, 6004 target a GOC site and promptly begin attacking it as it summoned the elements in a fury. Using this opportunity, O5-1 ordered for the mongoose to take aim at the behemoth. You have my permission to fire when ready, gentlemen. As soon as that weapon is ready, fire at it without a second thought. The beast has shown us no mercy, and so let us return the favor. A massive green energy beam that darkens the sky shot down at 6004, noticeably tearing and damaging its body, causing it to let out painful shrieks that shook the earth. Yes, do not let up. Give it all we've got. 05-1 and the representatives watched as 6004 attempts to flee from the particle beam while attacking the GOC site, until it finally had enough. 6004 roared, and with determined speed, slammed its massive body down onto the GOC site, sending earthquakes throughout the area and nearly destroying the entire site. Full surge blast right now! I don't care if we destroy 200 miles of land, use every ounce of power we have. A massive burst from the particle beam slammed into 6004. The energy from the wave killed all life within 300 miles of the blast. 6004 was seen rising through the smoke and began to charge an energy blast of its own, disrupting the beam from the mongoose. After learning of its location, 6004 charged into space towards it. It approached the mongoose and used its maw to destroy the device before descending down to Earth as all of humanity feels their collective hope fade away. After 6004 came down from space, it disappeared for some time before being rediscovered at what is now Site 6004 in Walamai National Park in an underground lake deep in slumber. Many members of the Foundation, the GOC, wondered why 6004 ended its rampage so abruptly. Some think that after slaughtering billions, 6004 brought the world back to a state where it could be sustainable again and allow for the Earth to heal, to go back the way it used to be before industrialization was brought on by humanity. Some thought that due to the Foundation working to transform the world into one that is more reliant on renewable resources, less mass urbanization, and the growth of nature at large, the Rainbow Serpent was pleased and returned to sleep. Both theories are believed to be true as the destruction 6004 caused brought upon the prolific growth of nature and wildlife and brought humanity down to a more modest population with less focus on excessive waste and consumption. However, the truth is, in order to prevent 6004's reawakening, 
Tibbles and Lloyd created 27 consciousness nullification devices to keep the beast asleep, to prevent another rampage. Amnestics were distributed worldwide through the air and water to keep all that humanity had learned a secret once again. The Foundation now tasks itself with ensuring the world follows strict environmental policies and protects nature, in fear of the reawakening of 6004. The men took a fishing trip to the coast of South America, and while they're at it, they decided to sail around the coastline a little more. The trip itself was pleasant. The weather was glorious, and the sea was behaving herself for the first few weeks. He had to admit he was loving it, but it didn't last long. Something baffling happened and shook the men to the core. They wanted to check out an archipelago that supposedly was in the travel guide's words, breathtaking to the few dozen to have seen them. And true to those words, the views were spectacular. They were covered by emerald verdant grass, colorful flowers, and rocks that all seemed to be uniformly pointed towards the sky. Despite the oddity with the rocks and stones, he felt as though he was witnessing beautiful Mother Nature herself for all of five minutes. One by one, the islands started shifting, slowly at first, creating colossal waves that shook the boat like a leaf in rapids. They then shifted faster, moving in a serpentine fashion as an enormous black shadow of some sort of archaic behemoth clouded the water below for miles around them. It continued for some odd minutes, as the water soon became like miniature tidal waves that they barely made it over somehow, until all movement suddenly ceased and the shadow faded into the depths. The men looked at each other, soaked by the salty waters, and quickly made preparations to head to the mainland. Over there, look! A giant wave rose and was about to collapse on them. Brace yourselves! The wave crashed upon the ship, breaking it in half. As the men were tossed about in the water like a rag doll, they caught a glimpse of the creature, a behemoth that seemed to be the ocean itself. The men were but tiny specks of ants floating in the dark abyss. So this thing is responsible for their predicament, he thought. No, it was not responsible for anything that was happening. The Leviathan was merely existing, indifferent to the tidal waves on the surface, the sunken ship, or the drowning men. The survivors never spoke of what happened that day. The very thought of something that large prowling around the globe beneath the waves made the men question their own existence. So they decided to settle on ignorance, and ignorance is bliss. Hello everybody, I'm The Rubber. Today we bring you a SCP Foundation Keter class object, SCP-169. SCP-169, also known as the Leviathan, is believed to be an anthropod of gigantic proportions and the true beast behind the myth of the Leviathan. Much like many SCPs the Foundation has come across since its inception, the origins and true nature of such entities and objects are only theorized. 169 is no different. 169 was discovered by MTF Gamma-6, as the Foundation suspected anomalous activity stemming from the southern tip of South America in an archipelago. What aroused curiosity in Dr. Shirazawa and the Foundation itself was that the archipelago in question drifted several miles from their original locations in a rather serpentine fashion. After Gamma-6 was sent to investigate the islands, they were tasked with collecting soil samples, rock samples, vegetation, and any entities that they came across. If said entities were hostile, lethal force was authorized. A terrifying realization dawned on Gamma-6 as soon as they dug their shovels into the soil, and it promptly began to bleed much like the growths they took off of their rock-like plates that were scattered across the island. Feeling that further exploration was unnecessary, Dr. Shirazawa ordered Gamma-6 to return to a site near the coast of Brazil. The soil samples and growths found on the rocks were determined to be organic material and flesh, leading the doctor to understand that the archipelago was actually the spine of some gargantuan anthropod, hence why Leviathan is quite the appropriate moniker for it. According to Dr. Shirazawa and his researchers, 169 is estimated to be between 2,000 and 8,000 kilometers in length and millions of years old. Seeing that such other anomalies of a similar nature were not found on the planet, it was then decided that 169 was possibly the last of its kind. 
therefore almost nothing is known about the creature other than it is possibly dormant. This is believed to be the cause because it only sways or moves a little less than a mile every week and breathes periodically every few months. The ramifications of 169 being active would certainly be seismic tremors and tidal waves. So monitoring of 169 is to happen 24-7 in case of any changes in activity. By direct order of the O5 Council, all ships that come into contact with or near 169 are to be scrapped and erased from all records public and private. All individuals on board such ships are to be given Class A amnestics and told that they were involved in a shipwreck but managed to survive. Thankfully, these two events are rare as the archipelago is home to several species of endangered animals and plant life and so the area and islands are off limits, quite conveniently. Any images taken from satellites of 169 are to be changed and or destroyed unless they have been taken with permission or by the Foundation. NASA has generously offered for the Foundation to use their own satellites to monitor and take photos of 169 after the Foundation donated a large sum of them. The U.S. National Oceanic Administration came close to discovering the existence of 169 after they detected an ultra-low frequency sound coming from around the southern coast of South America. An SCP agent within the administration tried to prevent this news from being released to the public but failed in this task and the public at large learned of this. The Foundation, however, deduced from the news that the origin of the sound was in fact the head of 169. In the end, none was the wiser as to what made the sound. The O5 Council ordered that all attempts to uncover the truth of the noise were to be suppressed or sabotaged and undermined by embedded Foundation agents. Should 169 ever become active, it would mean the major seismic shifts in tidal waves, a natural disaster that rivals the vision of apocalypse. Several proposals have been made in regards to this possible event, and many have to do with the utilization of reality-warping Thamiel-class SCPs, as suggested by Dr. Shirazawa. Dr. Shirazawa had a vision. A past researcher appeared in front of him in a dream. An old researcher friend of his. Back then, she was known as Mary Nakayama, she was a lively woman, a bright spot in the bleak foundation. No matter what gore or horrific knowledge she witnessed or obtained, she always smiled and hoped for a brighter future, compared to Shirazawa's dismal outlook on the state of affairs. But that was the old Mary. Now she was known by her designation, SCP-001, the Godhead Eternal. After acquiring multi-universal levels of power and reality-warping capabilities, she had ascended to a high plane of existence, but promised that she would try to steer things right. It will take time, and to wish her luck before she left. He believed that she had returned to them through that dream of his, which of course brought terrible possible consequences as well. For why else would an omnipotent being such as herself make her presence known again in this world? That, and she said so herself. Shirazawa, my friend, she said, I have observed the world and the unfathomable universe that encapsulates our own and even the ones around that, and has determined that the Leviathan's stirring is simply the beginning of apocalyptic events set to come upon them soon. Visions flashed in Shirazawa's eyes. He was frightened by the hellscapes. If the Leviathan awakens fully, it will mark the beginning of a K-class extinction event. And should that happen, summon me, she said. She warned that she could only be summoned once and once only. Therefore, they must be extremely vigilant in preventing all disaster scenarios before they even think to have her aid. A Hail Mary, if they will. The O5 scoffed at him after hearing it. Do you have proof that she will indeed protect humanity and this planet from destruction? Surely you don't expect us to take a man's dream as fact, yes? Finally, it's about time a Thamiel class decides to help us out of its own free will. If she can prevent any K-class extinction event, then perhaps we should think about becoming more proactive with a few of our pressing problems facing the Foundation," he said sarcastically. But deep down, they all knew there was merit in Dr. Shirazawa's words. They have no such luxury. The doctor pulled out a small gray metal box with a small concave circle on the top of it that has a small hole in the center. She instructed any O5 council member to trickle their blood into this until the box is full, 
Only then will she be called here to protect us. I now give this to you. The doctor hands it over to the council and left the room. The council stared at the box, not sure what to make of it. They knew that the Leviathan could not be contained. One small move from it will rock the very foundation of the continents. They can only be saved once. If their demise doesn't come from the Leviathan, it would be from other threats. Apocalypse is inevitable in the end. Somewhere deep in the ocean where no light reaches, the Leviathan stirs.